Well, welcome again, everybody. We've got uh, about uh, folks just coming into the line right now. We'll get going here in about 30 seconds um, with some housekeeping things before we jump into the questions for Tom and Glenn. So give us about 20 seconds and we'll just get going here in a sec. Okay. Hi, everybody. It's noon on the East Coast, so thank you so much for joining us today. We are thrilled to have Tom and Glenn from ERB join us. A couple of housekeeping notes here first before we get going. Go to the next slide, Jasper. Um, just as a reminder, we're doing these webinars every Wednesday at noon. Uh, next week, we will be focusing on equity and diversity in distance learning uh, uh, operations that schools are working on now. And we'll be joined by Jean Batiste, who many of you know, was the Director of uh, Diversity and Equity and Inclusion at NIS for a number of years, has been working with independent schools on that topic for a long time. Uh, we're excited to get his guidance in that, uh, in that area next week. The week after that, we'll be joined by folks from the NCAA Eligibility Center to talk about NCAA eligibility and guidance related to that and allow for folks to have their questions uh, answered on that topic, which I know is starting to be top of mind for a lot of college counselors these days. Um, a couple other notes, just as, as many of you know, uh, many of you have been in our phase two online classes about preparing for the remainder of the academic school year to be online. Um, not surprisingly, we're working on some phase three things, so be prepared for announcements on that coming up soon. Uh, if you're not already a part of the academic leaders listserv, uh, we invite you to join that. And we are running at 4 p.m. Eastern every Wednesday and Thursday middle and upper school teacher meetups. Also want to let you know that uh, later today you'll be hearing some advice. You can go to the next slide, Jasper. Uh, you'll be hearing some announcements from us about summer programs at one schoolhouse. Uh, many of you know that we've been running academic courses for students to accelerate, explore passions, and complete, complete course requirements over the summer for the last number of years. We're also going to be revise, reviving a program that we used to run in the summer called Bridge Courses that help students review and gain key concepts from the prior school year. So uh, be on the lookout for, uh, for that information coming into your inbox later today. So we are thrilled today to be joined by Tom and Glenn from ERB to explore this topic around uh, understanding what learning gaps might be created as we go through this wild and wacky spring and what we might be doing in order to think about identifying those gaps and filling those gaps uh, uh, this summer and next school year. So Tom and Glenn, welcome. Thank you so much for joining today. Yeah, thanks, Brad. Thanks so much for uh, having us here. Uh, you know, it's a unprecedented time, obviously, lots of uh, unique challenges for schools right now. Um, and I know assessment's not necessarily on top of the list of, every, of things that everyone is worried about, and yet it uh, comes, rises very quickly to near the top of the list for a number of reasons. Absolutely. Absolutely, it does. And I know that folks, again, are going to just enjoy the expertise that you have. As a reminder to everybody that's joined us today, uh, I'll just ask Tom and Glenn a couple of questions here to start, and then Sarah and I will moderate questions that are coming in as well. Um, from all of you. So as you have questions for Tom and Glenn, please click the Q&A button on the bottom of your Zoom screen and put those questions in there. And Sarah and I uh, will, uh, will make sure that those questions get asked. Okay, so the first question I'd love to just know a little bit about is what resources is ERB making available to educators and families right now to help them through uh, the COVID-19 crisis? So I might lead on that one, um, Brad, and you know, a little bit of context first. Um, we know, um, we've long known actually, that assessment is most valuable for uh, innovating schools. It's a way to show that students are learning what they need to know to demonstrate uh, the effectiveness of the educational program uh, despite or because of the school's experimental um, uh, stance or directions. And right now, all schools are innovating schools. Everyone is experimenting. We're in um, unknown territory. So um, we know at ERB, and we've been working really hard to support what has been an abrupt and unexpected transition to distance learning. 
Um, so in the immediate term, to address your question uh, directly, um, a number of schools have taken us up on the offer of the free writing practice program for the rest of the academic year. And this is um, a self-guided, online, um, AI-driven uh, writing instructional program that students can follow and they get feedback through the AI algorithm. Teachers can monitor um, how much work they're doing and how they're progressing um, and put their own, obviously interact with students to put their own uh, stamp on it. Uh, that's something we announced a little while ago and um, uh, you can easily find uh, that resource by going to the ERB website and uh, looking for the Writing Practice Program, or WPP. Uh, we also know, um, Brad, were you about to say something? Or I, I was just you. gonna ask, uh, for those unfamiliar with that program, Tom, what are the appropriate grade levels for the WPP? Great question. Glenn, can you help me on that piece of it? Sure, um, so we typically, uh, the most popular grade levels for that program are grades three through eight. Okay. And um, what uh, the, the the people who use the program tend to really value is the fact that the results are presented immediately after students submit their writing. And they're fairly detailed. They're, uh, re they're, they're feedback on six different traits and each trait has a, a particular rubric uh, to guide the, uh, the feedback that's given. And so um, it does really help students practice and, uh, and benefit from, from trying out different essay prompts online. That's great, thank you. Sorry, Tom, to interrupt. I didn't no, know you're no, about thanks. to talk about another program too. This thanks be for that, for yeah. Folks. So we also know that uh, SEL work is one of the hardest to transition to a distance relationship. Uh, and yet at the same time, there's been just a glut of resources offered uh, over the last month or so um, in, that, uh, in that area. So uh, what we uh, are doing in, uh, is to curate a selection of SEL perspectives and exercises uh, on our on our website, and um, uh, in a moment when I have a sort of chance to look through my too many open files, I'd love to share the screen with exactly where that website is, so that it becomes a part of this um, uh, of, of this record. Uh, and then the third thing I'd want to mention in the uh, short term is uh, an announcement that actually we are planning to make this afternoon, or depending on how things play out, no later than tomorrow, uh, which is that. The uh, IC will be available, the admission test will be available to students uh, at home um, with, in a proctored, uh, secure um, uh, fashion so that schools can continue to do their admission testing through the spring and into the summer at the tail end of the, uh, of the full admission cycle. And we'll have a fuller announcement on that that we'll get out through as many channels as we can uh, find, but certainly on the homepage of our website uh, very soon. That's great. That's really wonderful. So that's certainly one way that ERB is supporting schools with testing options this spring. Um, can you, can either one of you talk though about uh, other ways that ERB is supporting schools with testing options? We know that a lot of schools are used to doing their CTP testing, for example, in the springtime. I can speak to that. And, and first, let me say it's a pleasure to, to join you, Brad, today and to support member schools with uh, this unprecedented crisis that they're dealing with. Um, so Tom mentioned the admission testing uh, that we are doing with at-home proctoring. We're also supporting achievement testing via the CTP with at-home testing options. And uh, what's different about the two approaches is for the IC program, our partners at Prometric will be proctoring the exam for students. Uh, so schools won't be involved in that process and it will mirror pretty much the same procedures that students and families have when they enter a Prometric test center. Um, our members will receive test scores uh, for the IC, uh, but they won't be involved in administration. Uh, for achievement testing with the CTP, it's a little bit different. We're asking schools to administer the exam to their students at home and to follow the same procedures that we have in place for CTP online testing, which are well-established and well-honed, uh, with the exception that uh, teachers and administrators, administrators will be proctoring uh, via video conference using Zoom. Um, so uh, we've got um, extensive uh, materials to support implementation available on our website on the CTP portal. Um, I can also sort of pull up that site later if, if we wanna see what that looks like. 
um, but we've we posted all, all of our materials online there and also have um, a link on our homepage if a member wants to just speak with somebody about this program and talk through some questions. We've, uh, we've heard from over 200 members uh, that have interest in doing this and they really want to know what to plan for. Uh, one interesting point that uh, came up today is that, uh, or actually yesterday, we had our first uh, school administer CTP online at home. And uh, several dozen students took the exam and uh, they were able to acquire, to, to obtain their scores immediately after the assessment. It was frankly a little bit bumpy. Um, we sat in with the school and it was their first time doing CTP online testing. They were a paper school. And mm -hmm. so they were kind of working out the kinks in this sort of new way. Uh, but it was, I would count it as a success. And every time we administer another one of these at home, we're learning a little bit more and we're adjusting our directions for schools. Great. So if, if those are two ways, for, first, folks, if you have questions, please make sure to put them into the Q&A forum. I think that those are two um, key key topics to be covering. It's interesting. Let me, let me ask a follow up for you then on that. For schools that are used to running the CTP test in the spring, would you encourage them to stay on that cycle right now and to try to move to the online format? Or would you encourage them to do something different? You know, the way that I always, I mean, maybe Tom wants to no, no, let's speak please. first. Well, let's, let's tag team. I mean, the way that I always answer this question is to say that we want to support schools in what, in, in, in what they feel they should do to best support learning. Mm -hmm. And see as a theme throughout this webinar, we're trying to be as flexible as possible and give schools as many options as they, as they need. What do you think, Tom? Yeah, no, I, I think that perspective is exactly right. And there's obviously a sense in which this spring and summer will be unlike any other. Uh, so the data uh, from uh, whether a school tests at home with CTP this spring or uh, moves to a fall testing cycle, there will always be a certain break point or a certain asterisk next to it. We understand that, uh, which is why we simply want to give schools as many options as they can, as they can have. Yeah, and I want to actually build on what, if that's okay, Brad, build on what Tom just said, because um, ERB is launching a new program for back to school next year. It's yeah, let's called, transition to that. Let's, let's think then going into next fall, how, how a school might think about this. That sounds great. Yeah, and you're aware of this too, Brad, uh, um, as, we've, as we've talked about. So the Milestones program is a complement to the CTP, um, except that it's a much lower intensity, brief version of the CTP that only includes two subtests, reading comprehension and math. And the reason I mention this in the context of COVID-19 is that we feel that um, for schools who simply cannot test this spring, um, they're not able to do at-home CTP testing, the most helpful option for them would be to administer the milestones assessment in the fall and um, to get a quick look at students' overall uh, level of learning and any areas in which they have particular strengths or weaknesses. Um, many schools, I think, are going to be feeling quite in the dark after a six month hiatus of, um, uh, of not having uh, in-school learning. And so what can really help them is a data point um, in, in the beginning of the year. So the way the Milestones program works as a complement to the, to the CTP is we offer these, program, these assessments in the fall, winter, or spring. And uh, for schools that are administering the CTP in the spring, they can uh, administer milestones in the fall and winter. Um, the first fall assessment is this learning check. The second assessment in the winter is a kind of a follow-up. So for school students who perform particularly poorly or to just get a check on learning for all students um, mid-year, the milestone assessment is available. Uh, and then to your, to your earlier question, um, uh, schools that are, are typically administering the CTB in the spring, we recommend that they administer it again in the spring of 2021, and that will allow them to preserve their longitudinal trend data to um, 
have a very robust and, and fulsome look at all of the areas that we measure and uh, a good tool for evaluating curriculum eff effectiveness. So let me just recap on that to make sure that we get that answer super clear for schools. So schools have a couple of different options for this spring. Um, they can move to online testing environment if they haven't moved to the online testing environment and or if they do not think that it's right for them to offer a spring uh, CTP test date, then they can uh, engage, they can still get a snapshot of where their students are through the ERB milestones program this fall and winter, which will help them again identify some of the gaps that may have been created over the previous six months. Do I have that right? You got it. That's a Great. perfect Thank encapsulation you. of what exactly we're doing. Right. And Brad, I know you want to get to uh, questions that participants might have, but if I could um, share the screen for 30 seconds just to uh, get it up there of uh, some resources that we've uh, spoken about. The, uh, the web page for the curated uh, SEL uh, information that we've, um, that we've created on top. Yep. And the, our web page for the writing practice program, which again <clears throat> is free to um, uh, all, uh, all member schools uh, through the end of the school year. Um, and then uh, to individual contacts, as, some, as people may have questions, we have two member service directors uh, who uh, people can reach out to, Jason Lesnetsky, Sarah Savage, their emails are here. Uh, and if people have more program specific questions about either the IC or CTP, uh, they can direct them to the executive directors of those two programs, Rochelle Michelle for IC and Ryan Downey for CTP. That's fantastic. I, I, I really appreciate, I think everybody on this call appreciates, on this webinar appreciates, um, the way that ERB uh, is reaching out uh, and helping schools, uh, both with free resources and thinking about things very flexibly uh, in regards to the admission program and the CTP program. And uh, the Milestones program probably couldn't have come along at a better time. Uh, we do have a few questions that are coming in. So let me ask the first one for you. Uh, Corbett is wondering, uh, do you have any data around expected deltas when schools change? And I think that that's either maybe change from spring to fall testing or change from uh, paper to online, too, is mm -hmm. probably part of that. Uh, Corbett just clarified to me, spring <laughs> to fall. See the clarification, well. spring to fall, yeah. Got it. Um, so one thing to keep in mind about the Milestones program and the CTP program is that we use a vertical scale. So that accounts for different times of years when students will test. Um, so the, it's, it's, think of it like the scale in your bathroom. Um, the measurements are always the same. And um, what changes are the norms that we use to interpret those measurements. So we have fall and spring norms for the CTV. We had those for a long time. For the milestones program, we'll have fall, winter, and spring uh, norms to help with those interpretations. <clears throat> so Great, that um, answers it, another I, question I'd really that just like came to extend, in. Yep. I'd really like to extend Glenn's metaphor because on the one hand, um, if you shift from fall to spring uh, or spring to fall, uh, you, your school, your results would be compared against other schools that are testing in the fall. On the other hand, we all know that our weight fluctuates during the day. And if we typically weigh ourselves in the morning and then we start weighing ourselves uh, in the evening, we're going to get a different result. And while we might have a norm pool to expect, actually, I don't know what happens. If we generally gain weight or lose weight during the day, we might know that to adjust in that way, but you'll never be able to know exactly how your metabolism, or let me drop this extended metaphor, mm -hmm. your school would actually be affected by that shift. So it does represent um, uh, uh, a shift that cannot just be statistically controlled or erased. Great. Great. Um, Sandy has a couple of questions and folks, if, if, if I can remind everybody to put their questions into the Q and A, not into the chat area, that would be super helpful just to make sure that we uh, are organizing all of these questions here. Um, uh, another question that came in and I, I don't have the context for this. And so, um, uh, hopefully, uh, this person can help us with this. Will there be a skill breakdown on the math? And I'm guessing is that's related to the milestones program too? Yeah, uh, let me hit some of the high points in terms of the design. And, and by the Great. way, for people who are interested in more information, 
Uh, we have a website uh, specifically um, geared to this program. It's called, it's at erblearn.org backslash milestones. Some of the high points. Um, when I mentioned that the milestones program was a complement to CTP, I failed to include the detail that it uses the same score scales and it will have the same content standards mastery scores as the CTP. And it will also use the same norm pool. Um, so, and basically um, it's a, a short form of the CTP and that's what our members asked for. We, um, we conducted a lot of outreach with them and they said uh, for this to be helpful from a pedagogical standpoint, we need to have results on the same scale and uh, with the same level of detail and the same norms. Um, what we're also doing that's going to be different um, for, uh, for milestones and, and CTP as well is we're adding criterion referenced interpretations. And that's really exciting. Um, we have uh, some technical advisors who said, you're doing great on the norm reference interpretations, uh, but uh, it would be helpful to give some criterion reference feedback as well. So we're actually um, uh, working with uh, several dozen teachers to help us interpret what level of performance on these assessments reflects meeting expectations and exceeding expectations. So we'll be providing criterion reference feedback for milestones as well. That is great. So uh, I think that that answers Sandy's question that she's put into the chat box, but I wanna make sure on this too. Uh, so I, her question was, is there a way to compare the fall milestones data to the traditional end of year spring data? Absolutely, and, and it goes back to that scale metaphor. Um, so imagine you weighed 100 pounds in the fall and you weigh 120 in the spring. Um, the plus 20 points is your growth over the year. And uh, we can measure that reliably because we have these very strong vertical scales on CTB and milestones. Uh, and identify an expected growth from fall to spring so that you can um, not only understand uh, the trajectories of the different students in a given class, but you can also understand what those trajectories look like against a, a general uh, sort of external set of norms. That's fantastic. Uh, folks, feel free again to put any additional questions that you may have into the Q&A box. Um, I'll ask an additional one. Are there other, uh, other, other places you can think of, if you were a school leader, that you would be um, uh, really interested in digging into and in identifying student gaps in learning uh, mm -hmm. as we get into the summer and fall? I think that maybe Tom, you and I can contact in this. I think that we're, we, we'd answer in a very similar way. Um, <clears throat> ERB has uh, partnered with uh, Rethink Ed to offer social and emotional learning programming. And our contribution to that partnership has been to create an assessment of social and emotional learning competencies. It's very brief and it's really guided to helping educators help students uh, refine and build on their competencies. But one of the things we realized after very quickly after we um, started getting data back is what power there is in linking social and emotional learning competency data with learning achievement data. Mm -hmm. And there are really uh, important relationships that you can see in those um, data points. And moreover, um, there's this notion that if you're helping students develop in social emotional learning areas, you're also going to have a um, corresponding impact on their learning achievement, which we all kind of know intuitively, but seeing that effect in the data has just been very powerful for us in schools. I would uh, I'd piggyback onto that. I, I mentioned at the beginning of the webinar that all schools are now experimental schools um, per force uh, by, by, uh, by dint of the environment. And um, one of the aspects of that experiment, of course, is trying out different distance learning techniques. I'm sure that there's not a single uniform school philosophy that's managed to develop over just a few weeks. Different teachers are doing different things. Uh, and actually, Brad, I think it was from you that I heard the intriguing um, uh, um, anecdotal finding that students who are extroverts um, might not be doing as well in the transition to distance learning because they are so relational, relationship-oriented as students who are introverts. 
yet another opportunity to understand uh, the impact of this experimental moment and distance learning by combining um, data from our SEL measure and our CTP measure. Now, I really don't want this webinar to be kind of a kind of a sales pitch. I guess what I would say in general is that the more data one can collect on student learning in this time, and the more you can relate that to the, to other aspects of how the school understand how teachers understand the students and their characteristics and how they learn, the better prepared the school will be to um, absorb the lessons from this moment and assuming that the future is going in a certain direction anyway, to use those lessons to become a really effective educational environment in what might be a future hybrid um, scenario of in-person and distance learning. This is a, a special moment and looking at it in a certain way, it's a glass half full moment where there's a lot of opportunity. Yeah, and so we should be thinking about measurement broader than we typically have in the past. I think that's one of the key takeaways from this. Yes. I think for us to unlocking the power of those measurements through better reporting platforms is really where our emphasis is. Mm -hmm. And um, again, I don't want this to be a pitch either, but we're really excited that we're making some important improvements to our reporting that will be a part of the milestones program and CTP next year too. Great. Um, another question that we had come in uh, is what would you recommend that we as academic leaders recommend to families to support their kids learning over the summertime. Are there, are there tools, resources, places that from your perspective and where you sit, uh, you should be thinking about offering out to families? Well, with the, you know, the summer melt um, uh, phenomenon is long known and the, uh, the COVID melt will presumably be even more severe because uh, students haven't had the um, uh, on campus educational experience right up until June. So I think the question is very well placed. Um, the, I mentioned the writing practice program that we've made free for schools to, uh, to use with, with students. And again, a few schools have already uh, taken us up on that. There's also a, um, just a, a direct to family version of the writing practice program. Um, that uh, uh, we've made uh, uh, parents who were in direct contact with because they've used an IC in the past, we've made them aware of that. And quite a few parents have already, um, that's not free, that's something that parents have to purchase. Um, but parents have already taken us up on that in fairly significant numbers. And so I think the philosophy of um, uh, every parent is a little bit of a, uh, of a homeschool um, uh, coordinator now uh, is the philosophy that's being adopted. I know there are a lot of educational resources out there, um, and, and I'm probably aware of fewer of them than many of the people on this webinar, but uh, the writing practice program, again, for parents, uh, it, it's for the students, but for parents to use in the family, uh, is a, a really terrific tool that can keep students thinking, organizing their thoughts, and expressing their thoughts in writing during the summer. And if, if I may, you know, one um, other idea that I would mention as important is project-based learning. Mm -hmm. A lot of the research is showing that that can have tremendous impacts on learning achievement, but it's also the sort of activity that um, a student can, um, can work on over an extended period of time, uh, such as, such as the, this spring and, and, and throughout the summer. Um, on the other hand, I also know that parents, educators, and even the children are stressed right now. And what is also important for them to do is, is to kind of take a break over the summer as well and, and, and come back to school fresh and ready to learn. Uh, but project-based learning comes to mind as, as one other activity to think about. Great. Well, again, Glenn and Tom, thank you so much for joining us today. Uh, next week, again, our webinar will focus on diversity, e equity, and inclusion with Jean Batiste. Uh, we'll look forward to having that conversation and invite everybody who's joined us here this week to join us again next week. Thank you again, Tom and Glenn. Thank you, thank you so much, Brad. And uh, everyone who's on, thank you for all you're doing. I know it's a really uh, difficult, stressful time, but um, the world is grateful to you as educators. Yeah. Stay safe, everyone. Okay, thank you. Bye.